Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Lamari and I am the Senior Director of Community Engagement at DIFF. And this is our very second in our series of Ask Me Anything sessions that we're doing with our engineering community. Um, so if you actually want to keep on top of these events and make sure that you know when we drop another one, I would encourage you to go to our Eventbrite page and subscribe. Um, so you'll be the first to be notified. Um, and then you can sign right up and don't have to worry about, um, you know, tickets running out. So I'm going to go ahead and drop that in the chat if you do want to subscribe there. Um, and I do see a lot of familiar faces here. Um, I don't think I know everyone, but if anyone hasn't had a chance to uh, join DIFF, I definitely would encourage you to join. Um, I will go ahead and drop the, the join page here in the, in the chat. Um, we do have a work item for the decentralized web nodes that is ongoing biweekly on Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Uh, we do ask, it is IPR protected, so we do ask if anybody wants to participate, uh, make sure to sign a membership agreement and also sign the work group charter. Um, and that's 9 a.m. Pacific time. Um, so I do want to now introduce our guest today. So we're being joined by Daniel Buckner. He is the head of Decentralized Identity at Block. He's been involved at DIFF for a number of years. He also served as executive director of DIFF from 2017 to 2019. Uh, now, today, the way we're going to be doing the questions is um, you can take your choice. You can either drop a question in the chat or you can raise your hand in Zoom and I will call on you. I will be alternating between the chat and the people in the room raising their hands. Um, so I'll be going back and forth there. Um, and try to keep your questions uh, relatively brief um, and to the point, because I imagine there's going to be a lot of questions, and I imagine we're probably going to be having some more people hopping on throughout the hour, uh, since we did have a lot of a uh, pretty good number of ticket sales on Eventbrite. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand it over to Daniel, who he's going to share a few words, and then we can get started on building questions. So go ahead, Daniel. Great. Yeah. And I, I do see in the chat the, the link, the direct link is something that, like, if we can get a hold of that, um, that would be kind of cool. Oh, another channel. Great. I'll get started. Cool. So, um, yeah, so how do we, where, where should we start here? I guess we can go over a little bit about just conceptually what this what this body of work, this thing that we're doing the Ask Me uh, Anything is. Um, <clears throat> I'm just one of the editors, one of the people working on it. Um, Decentralized Web Nodes is a spec and diff. Uh, like like Omar said, it, you know, it's a group that meets uh, bi-weekly and we kind of are working through the specification and different groups are implementing. Um, Block uh, is one of the, you know, more significant implementers of the spec. Uh, the spec is still in flux, but we hope to have it completely finished off with a, at least for an MVP of a V1, uh, with implementation in late May. Uh, and so that's something that we've committed to as an organization. What it really is, is a personal data store. Um, this is not a, an entirely new concept. In fact, it's, it's I mean, I, I don't know, Drummond, you probably know better than I do. It's got to be 20 years old or something, right, Drummond? Um, Most but, of you that. Know, yeah, right. It's pretty, pretty close. Like it's just the concept of people having a personal data store, you can kind of think about it in broad strokes as, you know, like a, akin to having your own open source encrypted Dropbox. Um, and, and there's a range, right, of, of different types of implementations and, and, and constructions of these things. I mean, in the most simple sense, some, some personal data stores, you know, they're not intended to be application focused. Some of them are really just like encrypt data with keys that you own. Right, and and you look through it like you would just like a file system, right? Not not super interactive. It's mostly just for archival purposes or just looking through stuff file at a time on your own, like you know, as a human. Um, and it ranges all the way up to like some of these other data stores, kind of like that are are much more about being an application data store where you could permit applications to read and write to data, and almost like like a Google Firebase, but if you imagine it as open source and more decentralized, right? So so there's a sort of whole spectrum. Of, of this under this umbrella concept. And we we would say that I think decentralized web nodes fall 
a little bit closer to the more active like application data store, maybe not as quite as robust as, as the application code that you could write against something like Firebase, but, but close. Um, so we're definitely skewed towards, towards being more feature rich. Um, DWeb nodes in, in concept are not things that are intended to just be run by hosts, right? So if you're running a DWeb node, you should be able to run one on your, your local devices um, so that you have a copy of as much of your data as you'd wish to be on, like say your phone or your laptop, and then also have the ability to have that data um, you know, replicated outbound to remote locations. Like, you know, traditional hosting providers could, could provide this service just as they do Dropbox or OneDrive or any of these other things, but maybe through a more standardized means, um, st you know, DWeb nodes kind of provide you that standard. Right now, all of those, those things are just products, right? And they have their own APIs and their own way to do things. Um, one note is that if you were to host your DWeb node externally, um, the expectation and the guidance in the spec is that obviously you don't give your private keys to data that's encrypted to uh, entities that are not you. You might have your private keys on your DWeb nodes that are running locally on your devices, but you shouldn't you know, provide those keys just as you wouldn't provide your DID keys to Google or something if they happen to run it. Um, what that means is that to, to a large degree, outbound like remote DWeb nodes um, that are you know, peers of the ones that live in your devices are mostly run externally for availability reasons. Right? You'd say, well, why do you even want to do that at all? Well, um, the reality is that your phone is not always online. You might be out of a service area. You might be on a plane. You might be sleeping. Turn it off. There's all, all sorts of reasons why you would want your data replicated at a location where people could look it up and, and access it, you know, either freely accessible information uh, in the sense of like tweets, right? You, you want those public. It'd be pretty silly if those were encrypted um, or maybe publicly or privately permission data, like, you know, maybe it's uh, encrypted medical data and you want to give permission a capability um, in technical sense to your doctor and they could look it up, right? Maybe you're, maybe it is a situation where you're literally knocked out. So you can't help them with a local device. You have to have them be able to, to, to access this. Um, so, so the configuration that we kind of think will be the norm with the web nodes is that you'll have them on your devices. Um, that'll have all or a subset of your data. You'll probably have some outbound remotes. It, most likely those will be through the provider of your wallet. So when we talk about a wallet, like a DID wallet, the people who are providing the software that allows you to um, you know, manage your DIDs and manage your data, they're probably gonna be providing a DWeb node for you. Um, most users probably won't know about it or care. It'll just be sort of something that's that's there um, that they help, help you cache your data somewhere that is you know, accessible. Um, and then you, you could, if you're a more advanced user, you could run, you know, a special always on desktop machine, you know, at your house, uh, kind of like people would run their own Bitcoin node or run their own, uh, you know, they have like get umbrell and they sort of sort of run their own software. And that's totally possible too. You just have to want to do it. Um, and that gives you the ability to have this data synced across all those devices and locations and have some, some robustness so that no one device getting lost or no one host saying, oh, I don't want to host for you anymore is a loss of your, your personal identity information. Uh, one thing I'd say is the DWeb nodes are not just about identity data in the sort of traditional sense. When we talk about identity you know, on this call and as we start taking questions, identity data is typically thought of <clears throat> in the identity access management industry as like this sort of stodgy, very small subset of data, like you know your your driver's license is like a traditional identity data thing, or social security, or like you know these more governmental forms of identity. I would posit to you that identity is 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 everything. It's it's almost all of your data, right? Your groceries, your grocery list, um, your tweets, all of that's identity, data, right? Because anything to, from, by, or about a person, company, or entity is identity information. It's about something. So if we had to view the world, like almost all, all information is identity information in that sense, because there's hardly any information on the web that isn't too from buyer about something. Um, it, it wouldn't really be that useful if it wasn't, right? So, so DWeb nodes are intended to include all the application data as well, not just your core identity proofs and credentials, but things like your tweets or your, your uh, you know, toots or whatever the hell they are on all these you know, alternate social networks as well as um, anything else, right? So pictures that you might store, um, x-rays you might get, tax documents, whatever you do in your life, right? And, and you, you permission it as you see fit, you encrypt it if you want, you expose it public if you want. Um, so that's the basic setup for DWeb nodes. 
Um, I'll probably leave it there because I feel like that's enough of a boot up at least for this general call so we can start getting into the actual questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so as I mentioned, um, some people maybe haven't hadn't hopped on yet, yet on the call. Uh, feel free to drop your questions either in the chat or raise your hands in Zoom, and then I'll go ahead and call on you in order. All right, Drummond. Go yeah, ahead. I'll start out with just sort of a, a common question about DWNs that I, I'm, I think I know the answer to, but I, I figure it will help us get going. And, and probably a lot of other folks have the same question, which is, do, 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 uh, well, actually, when you answer this question, uh, please share what you think is the preferred uh, 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 short term uh, um, acronym or, or the way you pronounce uh, DAWNs or DOWNs or whatever you call them, de decentralized web nodes. But anyway, the question is, do they run in the cloud or do they run locally or do they run both? What's your vision for where these nodes actually exist? Yeah, so I think they should definitely run on your local devices. As I, I like, our hope is that that's your, you know, your your uh, your primary mode is that you at least have them there. And I do think that they will be running in the cloud as well. Um, I think it, you know, right off the bat, it's going to be, you know, you can imagine if you get a wallet application that houses your DIDs and your credentials, likely that application itself is going to have a DWN inside it and is using, um, you know, within it is using that DWN to cache all your data and store your data there. Um, that same vendor is probably going to have a server version that's set up that also syncs to that and has your data remote because, you know, it wants to allow for, you know, data you permission others to see and public data to also be accessible uh, more real time on the web. So it's not, you know, beholden to the like, requests coming down to your device because that's just really not feasible uh, to be able to, you know, use your, your phone as a web server that's always on, right? So I think it's that's the primary setup. We would hope that it's also on people's laptop machines or desktop machines. We are putting out, us as Block are putting out an open source desktop wallet based on Electron that actually has a DWN in it. It doesn't bother users with like understanding DWNs. It's just there and applications can store data there. But that's that's the premise. We hope it's both. And the wallet we're putting out, we're, we're doing a mobile wallet, um, we'll have one uh, within it as well so that you know, you'll have your data and you as a user don't have to worry too much about it. It'll just do its thing for you. Okay, so we're gonna take a question from the chat and then I'll come back to the room. Um, so Prashant asks, are there data privacy considerations like GDPR and how are they taken care of in this kind of a paradigm? Yeah, so this is yeah, GDPR, right? Obviously uh, general data protection um, requirements. Regulations, yeah, regulations. Um, I should I should know this better by heart, but uh, yeah, absolutely apply. Obviously, in the jurisdictions where those those laws are uh, you know are predominant, and DWeb nodes, of course, just like any other service that might be operated, have to adhere to GDPR. the The benefit of you know of DWeb nodes and really just a lot of the technology we work on in DEF and other places is that we're kind of inherently you know along the compliant lines, even by default. And certainly, you have to make sure, but the idea here with DWeb nodes is that you are 100% in control of your data store. So like, let's say Block was to host, you know, a, a copy of your data store that's not on your device, but hosted on our servers uh, or anyone else you choose. Um, yeah, I mean, you're inherently you have the ability to delete anything you want, right? Like that's just part of the, that's part of the gig here is that it's your data store. So, um, so there's no like data held or retained, like, you know, those things are designed to sort of answer, you know, to you and only you. Um, so yeah, that's how GDPR is dealt with. It's not a blockchain. So it's not this thing where like DWeb nodes are their own like little blockchain and you have to worry about, uh, you know, that data being not able to be erased or anything. If that's, if that's maybe a concern of people in the audience, DWeb nodes are basically a distributed system. They just happen to only distribute the files and protect the files of the user who um, is the owner of them. Um, so in that case, they're not like some crazy exotic form of uh, technology or server, if that makes sense. Okay, we'll go ahead and take the next question from Moises. Hi, Daniel. Hi, everybody. Let's see. Uh, as some of you know, I come from the healthcare world, uh, the medic. And, um, you know, researching web nodes to store, you know, one potential use case is personal health data. Um, on the specification, it actually, I read 
that when we construct those message objects, we actually have to call some sort of DAG in IPFS. So my question is, am I interpreting, interpreting correctly that we actually write into an IPFS node or do you actually mean so, IPLD? Yeah, so I believe, I believe the spec does say IPLD in the stack diagram. It may be used to say IPFS, which is a little misleading in the sense that it makes okay. people think that it's like some actual IPFS node, but it is IPLD. Um, and the difference there for anyone on the call, it's like, well, what are these acronyms that, you know, um, that Moises and I just exchanged? Um, IPFS is interplanetary file system and IPLD is interplanetary linked data. Those are just like fancy terms for a few specifications that a community gave to be able to um, have data be addressable on the internet. IPFS being a hash of data, being able to look up that hash and then find it from a set of peers on the internet, right? That is more of a globally published type of data where you might say, hey, I'm, I'm going to send out this, this data that is hashed to like all these other nodes on the internet and they're all going to serve it for me. Now, we don't do that for DWAP nodes. DWAP nodes are, are sort of private. They're, you know, they're private to the user. IPLD is just the data encoding. It's just the way you encode data. And so DWAP nodes do use IPLD and block store, which is a sort of a flat um, structure where you might take a file and you break it into little chunks. And those little chunks are compliant with a specification so that uh, other people can understand the chunks you send to them, but they're not being thrown out into the greater IPFS network and like being served yeah. out to everyone. It's just really we're using IPL, IPLD for, um, you know, just because we had to pick a way to chunk and hash data. And mm -hmm. that's a spec for doing so out there that's relatively common, both in the distributed systems community and, and others that have started to use it. Like it's integrated in Brave now and stuff. So um, so yeah, it, it definitely preserves privacy. It's just it's just a way that you can sort of deal with the shape and, and verification data. Very cool. I think uh, I'm gonna submit a PR because there's one part that says IPFS and that's, you know, I, I read that and like patient data, IPFS, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, please uh, do, please do, that'd be great. Uh, so. Can I make another question? Mm -hmm. Sure. Oh, all right. I just want to consume my others' time. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm understanding what you're trying to accomplish with uh, declaring protocols. And it seems like within the protocol definition, you also set up some access control rules. Uh, so my question is, how flexible or how dynamic are uh, these rules in the sense that, you know, today I might be allowed to write into somebody's down, of course, with their consent, and then tomorrow they change their mind and they want to revoke that. So would you be able to tell me how that revocation process works in a dyna dynamic fashion? Yeah, absolutely. So, so one thing to understand about the protocol section that we're still, we're still fleshing out, it's there, it's there in a skeletal form. And we've actually, Henry, uh, Tsai, who's on the call, he's the main implementer of this for us and, and the, the largest reference implementation to date. He's implemented some of the protocol uh, spec, not all of it, um, but I can describe what that is to people you know, in brief so they understand. The protocol's interface in the, in the DWeb node spec is so that you can create sort of, a, I, I suppose what I would call a protocol, like, like I see a DWeb node as a host of protocols that, that set forth uh, you know, a subset of data. Like it could be some JSON objects, some binary type objects, how the data relates to each other, and then what type of actors, we have actors that are defined in that part of the spec, can do what, right? So an actor is like anyone, the word anyone, right, is an actor. Uh, or a role sort of, it's not RBAC, so don't get too confused here. Um, either another actor might be author or recipient or participants. Those are the four actors that we have. And you can do things like create a protocol, like it's basically a JSON tree that says, hey, like anyone can do, can send me this type of message, right? Or only, you know, or an author of this type of message can reply with this type of message. Um, or send this binary file in response, right? Unlike an ACL, it doesn't actually name any specific DIDs or individuals. You're not, you're not like constructing a, a set of IDs that have special powers. So in that sense, it is not um, a scary, you know, <laughs> scary ACL list like, like you might see in some systems that catch flack. It's more for shaping traffic and exposing to the world the ability for people to do things. So one really good example of this would be 
um, like tweet, if you, if you did a protocol for social media as a, as a DWN protocol, you would create a definition and I can, let me, let me go ahead and just pull up uh, a gist so that I can grab it and send it to y'all. Um, this is maybe a definition that you might create. Uh, and this is, this is from an earlier incarnation. So please forgive it if it doesn't exactly match the spec, but I just put in a guest and that might be something and I can even share it. Let me just go ahead and share it because that'll help everyone you know, visually see this better. Um, Chrome window. Okay. So let me just go here, social protocol. So if you check this out, this is the uh, protocols configuration. It defines a set of objects. Right, it says that with labels. So a post is this object and here's the data format that it's allowed to be in. A reply is this type of object and here's the data format it's allowed to be in. This is what we mean by images within this protocol and it can be either a PNG or a GIF, right? And then, you know, here's some relay pointers like, you know, this is just another type of object in the protocol. So what I would do here under the structure is I say, okay, I want to post and publications required. So it has to be published, so basically exposed to the world. So when I put these posts in, you know, they're, they're open and accessible as you would expect tweets to be, for instance, if this was social media. Under, under a post, images can be there that are also publication required. And the only person I'm gonna allow uh, to attach images to posts are allow the author to write them, right? And I'm gonna limit the number to four, for instance. So like, this is sort of trying to mirror Twitter in the sense that I'm. I'm limiting each post to four images and only the author of a post can, can uh, attach images. And you'll see under post here, there's no actual direct uh, allow rule under post. What that means is that only the person who owns the DWN or the DID for that DWN can do this. So by default, it's sort of like, it's, it's turned off, right? It's not accessible by right. default. Only users can do posts. Under posts, only the author, who in this case would obviously be the, the user, can do images under posts. Replies, different, right? Replies can be recursive, means they can go in a thread. They're required to be published. You want people to reply, reply to unit to be accessible and allow anyone to write limit one, right? So I, so on Twitter, like usually anyone's allowed to reply to you unless they're on block list, right? So this is mirroring the protocol codified in terms, um, if that makes sense. So that's a little rundown of what protocols are. Um, I can go ahead and... I don't know how to stop sharing. Am I still sharing? No. No, you're good. Okay, good. Yeah. So that's a little bit of a rundown of what protocols are. And uh, can can someone guide me back to the specific question about um, you're just you're saying, hey, this looks like a permissioning system. Does that does that kind of answer through that walkthrough? Yeah. Protocols? Although I mean, of course, what you showed was under under the context of a social network protocol. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to uh, devise a protocol, let's say, for patient interaction with. Mm -hmm. their healthcare provider and you know they choose to share a certain amount of information not all mm -hmm. but let's say i get into an accident or somebody gets into an accident and they are taken to er mm -hmm. and then on er they find out that this person actually needs blood transfusion but at that point the patient needs to share in case this patient has i don't know some blood disease some aids let's say right mm -hmm. he's gonna get a puncture on his veins the providers, they need to know that this person actually has AIDS. So how would I devise a protocol that actually fragments that information of, you know, accessible to ER only and accessible to my uh, general practitioner? So protocols don't preclude the use of something we haven't really implemented yet, which is permissions. Uh, permissions being object style capabilities that um, you can give out explicitly to targets like DIDs, maybe your primary care physician, <clears throat> maybe it's your medical network that you're willing to kind of delegate authority to any one of their doctors, be it an ER physician or otherwise. And that is typically how you're going to, to do that. Protocols are not designed for, for delegation for, of, of authority and like being able to trans transfer like, you know, um, private encryption keys for sp to specific parties. Um, you would need to use a permission to do that. Like you might give a permission for your primary health care provider to say, look, everything under the fire HL7 um, schema bucket, uh, mm -hmm. I want you to have access to all that. And then I'm going to give you delegation ability. And then they would be able to, to further delegate, you know, maybe your the ER physician calls them up or, or pings them you know, through right. some sort of app. And then they're getting that delegated capability. So I, I think protocols is not as relevant 
for that Got particular it. use case. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, protocols is more for like large multi-party interactions. Like you could rewrite evite on there, right? Allow anyone to invite me to events or allow participants to invite me to events. And you make anyone that you've given a friend object to a participant. So now your friends can all send you events, right? It's for it's for sort of more collaborative application style protocols, not necessarily like very specific personal um, data exchange protocols. Perfect. So capabilities are coming, right? Yeah. Yes, Perfect. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. We did have a similar question about IPFS from Stephen, Stephen Bauer. Um, yeah, did he answer your question or did you have something? Yeah, yeah lastly, did, but maybe a quick follow-up question. Um, so Daniel, if it if it is a uh, IPFS network, right? Who are the node operators on this? And what's the significance around making sure that the data is persisted there and that the node operators and out of a sudden so, start coping it? Yeah, let me help out here. So it's not IPFS. It's not, the, these nodes are not IPFS nodes. They happen to use the same uh, data storage, like I'm talking about static data storage, um, you know, structure, which is like IPLD, Unix FS, like the same chunking scheme for like chunking up files, but they do not offer up this data into IPFS. Um, so IPFS is kind of, it, it's hard because IPFS encompasses all these technologies and an IPFS node is, is one conglomeration of that that does some very public things. But uh, whereas this is only using the static sort of data model and, and other capabilities that are within the IPFS ecosystem, but not necessarily the IPFS network. So these things are not transferring things over IPNS or over the IPFS network. These are essentially servers that are, you know, that sync with just each other. Your own nodes sync with your own nodes and they don't even use actually the IPFS uh, transports to do that. Okay, perfect. Thank you, appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Steve has been patiently waiting to ask his question. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Daniel's um, uh, DW and SDK questions per game? Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. So I was looking through, I'm looking at the uh, the stores and you kind of looks like you've got a message store, a data store and a block level store and as well as some sort of aggregator, kind of a controller. Can you sort of talk about the the break of those things, what each things are used for? Yeah, I mean, I could even have Henry sort of address this. If Henry, I, I knew you were yeah. sick a little bit, but it'd be cool to sort of sick, but uh, um, Daniel can fill in the gaps if I'm if I'm coughing or something. So, um, so as of now, um, the there that you're right. Um, there are two main high level stores, which is the message store and the data store. Message store is intended to store the you know metadata about the underlying, you know, the binary data or whatever data you're trying to store. So, which is basically the JSON objects that's accompanying the, the data that you're storing. So that's a message store. Um, and that includes all the, you know, the descriptive properties, um, a bunch of metadata about the, the data you're storing. Um, and then the, we have the data store and the data store is actually the, um, the store that stores the, you know, the data you're, you're storing um, that includes, um, um, that's essentially the the data that's the, you know the the the, the stuff that we are ch we're chunking up. Um, you know, like if you're storing a song, you know, you'd be chunking it up into many many chunks, right? So, in that regard, um, it is <clears throat> it is more IPFS related. Now, um, you see the block store um, um, in in the implementation. That is more of a implementation detail that we don't necessarily um need for a, a third party to sort of implement it, it, it. so in essence like we we want for a third party to be able to imp implement a message store and data store relatively easily but it's just that so happens that our implementation right now takes takes a dependency on block store for storing the data um itself but if, yeah. if you're a third party trying to write some uh, you know like create a different st data store to store on, let's say Azure Blob Storage or S3, Amazon S3, you might not even need to take a dependency on Block Store at all. I mean, sorry, so the yeah, the the IPFS Block Store um, um, library. And when when we say IPFS, we again we don't mean that it's actually running an IPFS node. It's just that the IPFS family of of repos does have a lot of different utilities inside, and we use some of those 
to be able to construct how the data is actually stored. In our, in our implementation, the data is stored in a level DB, right? So it works on both the browser environment and, and in the server, uh, which stores to file system on the server. So it's not like going anywhere to any like, you know, random place on the internet. Um, and so message store and block store are, like Henry said, places where you'll see the message objects that are defined in the spec, they're stored in the message store. The block store is for more of the binary, regardless of what type it is. It could be a JSON file, it could be an audio MP3 file, it could be a large movie. They're all just broken up into smaller pieces and they're stored in that block store. Um, and uh, yeah, I want to fill in the reason why we chose um, using block store is because of the, the requirements that we have for the data to be served out um, in a browser. And um, in a browser environment, you can only have, I think there's a size data size limit per, per, per logical data. And I, I don't remember how many kilobytes that is, but you certainly can st cannot store anything beyond like, you know, let's say hundred megabytes or something. So we needed a way to chunk it up and, and data store, um, yeah, taking dependency on block store the, the, the IPFS block store library it sort of handles that for us because everything is chunked um, within the browser's limitation. Cool. And then the storage controllers is just an abstraction over both the message and data. Sorry, can you repeat? Yeah. So there's also a storage controller. Is that just an yeah. abstraction over the, the uh, message and data? It's an abstract, it's a coordination between the message and the data. Yeah, exactly. Because, um, and, and then that it's really thin right now. Um, it's just because, you know, you want to be able to, you don't want to write the data um, and, and, and fail to write the message, right? So you, there's some coordination, um, then that's done by that, by that controller. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so we do have a question in the chat here from Maria, who is asking, how do you compare Webnode and Tim Berners Lee? I don't know if I'm getting this right. PODS slash Solid. Yeah, so Solid, the Solid Pods. Um, yeah, it's uh, sim similar in the sense that we're all in the personal data store family. Uh, like we talked about, like this is a a you know uh, it's not a new concept. Uh, it's been around for for almost two decades, um, and there's lots of implementations and attempts at this. Uh, solid Pods are one. I think we're distinct in a few ways. Uh, we have this concept of independent verifiability of the state of your data store, which is not shared with solid. So independent verifiability, I'll just discuss solid a little bit to give you a, a you know, pre-flight of this. They don't really have like first classing of certain DIDs. I think it was web ID for a long time, which is more along the lines of OIDC, which is sort of like trust your ID with an outbound third party. Um, their, their setup is more like almost like JWT token based access. So like once you give someone ability, like permission to write to your solid pod, um, if your solid pod is being hosted by an outbound party, you're going to be just trusting that that host is sort of like ingesting data, um, you know, that, that you allow, you know, via your token. And the, the problem there becomes, uh, there's no sense of closure or time, right? Like if you, if you ever give a, per, a per, you know, a token out, yeah, you can expire the token, but it doesn't capture what should be in your data store. So like, let's say your host comes to you a year later and says, oh, well, no, here's this piece of data I forgot that's actually supposed to be included in your set of data that you permissioned Bob to write. And maybe it was not actually sent out in the time that that permission was active. You would have no way of knowing, right? It's not independently verifiable what the outbound host does, but this data store is in the sense that um, and we haven't implemented this just yet, but it is under plan. You can kind of see where it talks about champs and stuff like that on protocols and, and um, permissions. When a permission is granted in, in our system, like Alice says to Bob, hey, Bob, you know, I want to allow you to write photos to my VWN. And you're like, great, that's cool. You know, Bob, Bob starts writing some photos. Maybe Alice lets that happen for, I don't know, three months. And then Alice says, you know, I don't want any more photos from you, Bob. Um, so Bob's written 10 photos. And at the time that, that Alice says, I don't want you to write more photos, she kind of gathers up some references to, to the 10 photos that Bob should have written. And she says, you know what? Here's the permission I gave Bob to do it. I'm going to close this permission. I'm going to kind of like seal it up. And I'm going to put the references to what should you know, have been allowed during that duration when the permission was you know, uh, able to be exercised. And I'm going to keep that proof. 
so that all my nodes understand that it's only these 10 photos that were supposed to be in relation to this permission to Bob. And if there's an 11th photo that Bob tries to deliver later that's and, and Bob says, oh, no, no, you just didn't get it from me yet. Alice can say, no, that's not in the set of information that I said was, you know, within the bounds of that permission when I closed that permission off. Um, so, so she has the ability to reject going forward. And if there was a, a photo floating around at one of the nodes that just had come in right after she closed the permission off, it'll be evicted, right? So it's essentially all the nodes deterministically listen to exactly the set of data that was permitted uh, by the user in relation to a permission. So in that sense, the backbone of permissions and what is attached to permissions, like the invocations of permissions are deterministically verifiable independently by every node and the user. So that there's no like trust of the, you know, the, 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 the host in that sense, to just say what now in future was related uh, to a certain person being permitted to do things with your data. So that's one way. And then also we're, we're setting this up as a masterless data store. So synchronization is like something that is key. And we have some prototypes for that. Um, and we'll be adding interfaces to the spec, like an actual sync interface that allows um, your data stores to come to the same state of data between them, um, which is another thing where we're not relying on like one primary host being a corporation that says, hey, all your devices need to sync to me and I'm the primary, like you'll listen to me about the state of your data. We want none of them to be in control. And in fact, if there were any more in control, your device ones, the DWNs in your like phone and your laptop would actually be superior to the others. So that's a couple of ways it's different, if that makes sense. So I, I'm seeing another uh, another question, I suppose. By oh, I'm uh, sorry. Yeah, I was sorry. I was muted. <laughs> oh, um, no. So um, yeah, May Ron is asking: Does Don allow or foresee applications that need cross user slash company synchronization? For example, DeFi applications that pose double span risks or supply chain applications, including international participants, to be synced. Yeah, so one of the interesting things with um, how we kind of view, uh, especially protocols, like protocol for supply chain, it, supply chains actually be a, an interesting one for protocols, right? So um, if pro in protocols, like you could see, you could set up like, just like I showed that social protocol, you could set up a supply chain protocol where maybe there are ships manifests and product objects and other things. And, you know, maybe there's a filter that says only participants can add these things to my data store. Well, a group of 10 companies could come together and say, we're all going to give each other permission, right? Actual explicit permission and make ourselves participants under this protocol so that, you know, only those 10 companies would be able to see the data that, that they circulated. And yes, we do believe that they should be able to sync that data. The one interesting thing about protocols is that you commit data that's intentioned for other parties to your own data store too. So we're doing this in our TBDEX work. We have a, a decentralized um, exchange protocol that we're layering on top of DWeb nodes using the protocols interface. That is basically an RFQ system where like Alice might go out to a PFI, which is like a bank and ask, hey, I need to exchange Bitcoin for fiat, right? So she has a, a quote that she or, or a request she wants to send them to do that. Now they can come back with a reply or, or a bid, right? And so in a system like that, traditionally in like ephemeral REST APIs, you would just send data outbound that you wanted to go to a different party. You wouldn't actually store it locally, right? Like when I make an HTTP request from the normal app on my phone, it doesn't like commit the HTTP request to my phone and then send it and retain it. It usually just has one side of the conversation, right? Like if I'm sending a request out to someone, they get the request, I might get their reply. So what, it, what that does in traditional application land is it splinters the exchange like the, your, your your counterparty has your part of the exchange and you have your your counterparty's part of the exchange um and and generally that's okay because it's centralized like you're talking to you know, you're using that company's app talking to that company's server so at the end of the day they have both sides because it's centralized in a decentralized system when alice is chatting with bob she commits the the response like a reply in chat to her own DWeb node, even though it's actually a response to Bob. And, and Bob does the same. When he replies, he commits it to his own DWeb node and then sends it out. So both participants are accruing the copies of the same conversation, right? Like I, I have full copies. It's, like, it's kind of like Signal, right? The full chat message thread arrives at both people's um, phones. Um, it's not just like 
your messages you send or their messages they send both. So that's, so that's yes, I, I think that the answer is yes, you would expect that to be synced and by default, um, the commitment of data to someone else is the commitment to your own node. So you're retaining that sort of, does that make sense? I hope, I hope what I said makes sense. It might not. It's a little bit of a complex topic. Maybe you could further annotate your question if it didn't make sense. Um, hi, here is Mahran. Yeah, maybe uh, what I'm missing is that those commitments might be bound to a time period. Of, and then how, how do you manage that as well? How do, you, how do we make sure that those commitments are uh, delivered on a specific time? Because that code is, uh, is valid only, I don't know, for five minutes, for example. So yeah, time is hard. We're not talking about, we're not talking about a system that's, this is not like some sort of, um, it's not an acid locking, a tr you know, like permissioned acid locking uh, sort of database type thing. It's not a, it's not a blockchain. So it, it doesn't do like, you know, double spend protection, like, you know, eventual probable consistency, sort of like Bitcoin. Um, this is a decentralized personal data store in the sense it's centralized to you, the user, like you might have instances on your devices and outbound remotes. And it is not something that guarantees if participants, um, like under a certain protocol, right, all start invoking messages or data sends to that protocol, that they're all going to be guaranteed of getting some finalized state within some sort of boundary like Bitcoin, like a block is being codified, if that makes sense. They will just get the messages when they get the messages. And if someone wants to, to block a participant from any further messages, they would essentially put a, uh, you know, a blocking message like into their data store uh, to disallow further activity. But anything they had already received is, is just part of their data store and they can delete it if they want. It's not, it's not a blockchain though. So if, does that help? I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah. thanks. It was clear. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, next question from Kabir in the chat. And he's asking, what is the best way to ensure that recipients of PII access via DONS are not persistently storing the information using their own digital agent? Okay, so maybe I can, uh, I'll, I'll try to clarify. So the best way to ensure that recipients of PII, so this could be, I, I suppose, any user or entity who receives PII about another user or from another user, um, are not persistently storing that information using their own digital agent. Can you define digital, What? because what, what, maybe some other terms, what do you mean by digital agent would be what I would ask, right? To just to understand. Um, so whatever SSI interface they're using on their side. Okay, so if you send someone data, and this is a truism beyond just DWMs, right? If I'm Alice and I submit PII to either Bob, who's just a normal person, maybe a person I have met, or, you know, I don't know, some company, uh, you know, who I send PII into a bank or something like that, uh, and they happen to be using DWNs, you're using DWNs as your channel or not. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they, I suppose, could store that on, you know, either their DWN or just regular old database, whatever, whatever that uh, communication mechanism and database is, right? Um, how do we ensure that they don't persistently store it? Well, it, A, it depends, should they? Should they be storing it? Like if I send uh, data to a bank that they need on hand about like some piece of financial information for the duration that I'm their customer, they are gonna store it. I mean, they're gonna store it persistently and they're, maybe their DWN encrypted for you or something of that nature, but they're gonna keep it. And they're gonna keep it because they have a business purpose to keep it and you, know, you wanted them to. Um, in other cases, if you share data with some random person on the internet because you get into an exchange, uh, you know, maybe it's a D-Web node-based social protocol and you send a tweet or a response or a DM to some other person and they get it in their DWN, yeah, you can't, you can't, you know, reach into their server and, and take it out. You have to, you know, you, it's theirs at that point. And I suppose, you know, if they're running a host, uh, if it's hosted somewhere, I suppose you could have someone serve their D-Web node host with a, you know, GDPR complaint or a takedown of some kind, um, which still doesn't mean that it's going to erase it from their local DWNs on their devices, which may have sent that data, right? You can't, that's definitely probably not going to get removed if they don't want it to be. So yeah, I think it totally depends. I think data is going to get stored usually for business purposes, certainly is going to get stored between peers. 
and your ability to take it back as it were uh, after you send any transmission is is just as is the same as any other web you know based uh technology in, in that sense does that help maybe yeah yeah it does i, I i'm just envisioning a use case where um you know an entity is able to resolve a ton of identifiers into relevant PII um, without the need to persistently store. So, you know, you've got access to say a million, you know, uh, DWNs with PII info, you're only storing the, the identifiers locally persistently. And every time you launch an, instant, uh, an instance of your, um, you know, on your end, you're able to resolve that in a view only mode, as opposed to um, allowing your employees the ability to persistently store them. And in that, in that case, I don't know if there's will be too much latency anyway to be able to resolve so many records. Also, not to mention you're relying on uptime from wherever that DW, the, the collection of DWNs are stored, et cetera. But anyway, I don't take up too much time uh, of this call, but thank you for your answer. Yeah, thank you. And I think you could be judicious with that. I mean, you can, you know, obviously if someone's viewing it in your web page and you don't want that to be, you know, stored, I mean, you could do whatever you can do on your side, um, offering up a view layer for that. But if it's the user's view layer and you let them have access to any DID or information um, with intention, you know, they're, you know, they could you know, store it. So, yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, so Moises said a follow up. I, I, it looks like he says, um, the in-browser embedded DWN does have storage restrictions. Let's say I have a second DWN hosted by some provider. Can the second DWN use a different store and have both DIDs, DWNs be in sync? So can you, can you, is this the same DID, just one's hosted yeah. and one's local? So again, the, the context is, you know, Henry was talking about the message store and the data store. And currently you guys use blog store uh, because there's restrictions within the browser. So let's say for this uh, down owner, uh, you know, they have their embedded browser DWN, mm -hmm. and then they also have a synced copy in some other locations, you know, hosted mm -hmm. by a provider. Can in, in theory, can we have a second implementation that supports a different storage mechanism for the data store and then still support the data syncs between those two downs? If I make yeah, this. so this is this is part of the spec. The block store, when you think about the block store and what the IP LD and sort of the codecs we're using are doing, they're mm -hmm. chunking up data that you put in, uh, you know, attached to messages. Like let's say it's a binary, like a big big audio file or something. They're chunking mm -hmm. up data in a standard way. And what we've done with the DWN reference implementation is that block store actually speaks to level. And in the browser, it stores the chunked out data into IPL, uh, into um, rather uh, index DB, which is a default, you know, standard browser storage mechanism that stores, stores a pretty significant amount of data. Um, and on the server side, that is uh, basically stored in still level, but level speaks to the file system. And the the reason why these are compatible is because the actual data is chunked up and stored the same way, right? These are still just data blobs. So yeah, when one that's from an in-page or maybe like web-based environment uh, syncs to one that's on a server that happens to at the lowest level be storing on file versus in the XDB, it still is compatible because these the data itself, right, is coming over the sync barrier is the exact same form, right? It's just what it happens to land at on disk level is, is mm -hmm. slightly different. It's going through an abstraction. It makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so cool. Uh, that one's done. Yeah, so uh, Stephen asks, would a DWN support the notion of computational enclave that allows um, it to securely execute on someone else's code to access DWN data, or, you know, compute it, maybe a federated ML model um, to send back information? So it's a really, really good question. Um, I have I have thought in depth about this, and and this is sort of like a a future looking feature that I do hope we can support. Um, what this, this would essentially look like probably is um, the user would homomorphically encrypt data and they would push it out to their DWM. And, uh, you know, an act, someone who they permission to access that data um, or, or be able to operate on that encrypted data would push out a homomorphically encrypted program uh, with keys that, that were you know, provided by the user. 
And that homomorphically encrypted program would then execute on that data, um, you know, wherever wherever the user decided, and, and then they could spit back an answer. Now, I, a couple caveats there. Um, there's performance limitations right now with with homomorphic uh, encryption that that kind of probably stand in the way of this being large scale. Um, beyond that, it's still difficult to statically analyze a homomorphically encrypted program in any way, partially because it's encrypted. Uh, to understand what kind of performance cost there's going to be before evaluation. So like if I was to say, here's a you know subset of my personal data and I've homomorphically encrypted it and I want some, comp some company or outside individual is gonna give me a program that's gonna operate on that data encrypted, which is possible, right? And the host, like say block was hosting would never see your data unencrypted, but you're able to run a program on it to like derive some information that's exported to the caller. Um, the issue there, is that I don't exactly know what's going to occur uh, when, when I execute that. So it might be very resource intensive. The only way that hosts will be able to limit that is to maybe do CPU clock stuff. Like, hey, I'm willing to execute this for no more than uh, 100 milliseconds of, of cycle time. And if not, I'll kill it and I won't send a response. Um, or just allow it to go for a long time, but they're gonna probably charge you, right? As a DWN owner and host, they're gonna say, I don't know what exactly occurred because I can't see the execution, but I know it ran for a long time. So, you know, at the end of the month, you might get a bill for $5 or something. All that is going to require a lot of A, homomorphic encryption being really robust, uh, probably being out there longer, being a little more performant, a lot of tooling for DWN hosts to, to be able to understand how, to let the user like configure how long they want stuff to run, how much expense they're willing to incur. I think there's a lot of ecosystem things to figure out, but the technology fundamentally does exist for this stuff. It, it does exist. It's just not something that I think we'll see added anytime soon to, to this particular spec. Yeah, just sense. a quick um, question back. I mean, are you thinking um, FHE in order to keep the model private from the DWN owner or or otherwise, because I, I, I just feel just purely there's a step maybe from the flap where you can say it's acceptable that the model, um, you know, is is known to the data owner, um, which would be the case in just classic, you know, federated um, machine learning scenario, right? Um, but it would it would just offer this um, pretty cool feature that I indeed can keep the data secret, right, or or private. And yet, still participate in a data economy of some sorts, right? Um, so, so I don't think for that it needs to have a FHE uh, for for protecting the model. I mean, there might be actual pretty good use cases where it's okay to uh, the model to be shared. Um, yeah, so I, I I think it's fine to do that. I mean, I think you're talking more about like like maybe specific hardware enclaves as being some an execution environment for this. Is that is that kind of what you're leading to? Like, well, yeah. Sorry for the word, right? I'm just thinking like mm -hmm. a like a. It does. It it just it just needs to be, you know, in a hosted DWN mode. Something, of course, that I can trust is shielded away from the hoster, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but more in a conceptual sense, you know, something that allows me as the owner to create an execution environment for code locally against my data that I can control. For that. You know, it's more like a conceptual sort of encapsulation of where that code executes for it to not to havoc, right? For for me, for the user to control what it actually is pulling out, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that that's that's definitely stuff that's that's in the realm of like that's encoding, um, encoding these things properly so that you know that you know your encrypted homomorphically encrypted data can only do certain things and only allows certain forms of execution. Um, is is certainly uh, a thing. I'm going to post in the chat here, by the way, just a uh, like one library, right? So Google has this one, uh, fully homomorphic encryption, um, that does allow you to kind of like do some stuff. But I, you know, the the hard part about this is it's difficult. It's still very difficult to tool in. Like if a user was to configure, oh, allow this data to be computed in X way or Y way. That's a super hard UX challenge to like raise that to a user and it, and typically this homomorphic encryption is done with the circuit encodings that are kind of really arcane. So it's hard to like distill those into like formally provable components where it's like, this means this, like I'll let you uh, process my date field, not my this one. So I think honestly, like the technology is kind of almost there, but it's 
it's a big UX challenge as much as it is like a technology challenge for how to make such complex things, you know, feasible for the users to configure and allow and disallow various activities. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, again, it just would be interesting to follow up at some later point. I don't think it needs FHE, right, in all yeah. this. I mean, I think it's just a state before that where it's still acceptable. So, yeah, sure. Okay, great. So we're just about at the top of the hour. So uh, we're going to be closing it off unless you want to squeeze in one more question. Daniel, I don't see anything uh, in the chat. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm good. This, You're good? This is, uh, okay. really awesome. Thank you. Yeah, this was really great. I want to thank everyone for showing up today. You asked some really great questions. And if you have any follow-up questions for Daniel, for me, for anything at Diff, I went ahead and I dropped my email in the chat. So thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you all at the next event. Thank you all. Thank you. you later. Bye. Bye.